All right, well, welcome everyone and thanks for tuning in to our second session of our second day of the 2021 Agricultural Faculty Academy webinar series. You are tuned in to the Nursery and Greenhouse Irrigation webinar. We would like to take a quick moment to thank our sponsor, Rainbird, for helping make this event possible and a quick moment for housekeeping notes. Everyone is muted by default, so we won't be disrupted by latecomers. Please keep your microphone muted throughout the presentation as this will help minimize any background noise. During the presentation, if you have questions, please ask them via the chat box. We will have some time at the end for questions, answers, and a discussion. So you can ask questions in the chat box and we'll get to them at the end. Um, and then also at the end, we can ask questions to each other verbally as well. Without further ado, I would like to welcome our speaker, Steve McCoon with Nelson Irrigation. Take it away, Steve. Thank you very much, Nicole. And uh, thank you for everybody that's attending. Um, and let me get the correct screen shared. Uh, Nicole, let me know if I'm not uh, in the good. right spot. Okay, great. So um, as Nicole mentioned, um, my name is Steve McCoon. I've, I'm a certified irrigation designer in the drip and micro aspect of our industry and uh, have been in the industry since 1983. Um, I live in Washington State and I work for Nelson Irrigation as a territory manager, which puts me over a, a significant part of uh, North America in, in the US and Canada. Um, we, just so you know who we are, we're the, we're the company that makes everything from uh, these uh, big gun sprinklers, we make sprinklers that go on center pivots, uh, in orchards and field crops, and in the greenhouse and nursery industry. A lot of them are, are used there. So that's who we are. Uh, there was a, uh, L, a company called LR Nelson that would make things like the oscillating sprinklers, etc. cetera. Uh, we are not that company, uh, but, but um, just so you know uh, who, who we are. Okay, now moving on. Um, today's discussion points on the irrigation of nursery and greenhouse crops. It's a, it's a really important topic. We're glad that you're here. And uh, when you think about the size and scale of the nursery and greenhouse industry, uh, as an example, in the state of Oregon, uh, largely in the Willamette Valley, the greenhouse and nursery crops being these large production nurseries of horticultural crops, uh, it's the largest industry in the state of Oregon for agriculture. It's over a billion dollars uh, uh, recently in recent years. So it's become quite large. And um, when you think about all the water inputs that it takes to grow a plant from, you know, seedling or seed up through ready to be marketable at a uh, retail nursery somewhere, um, there's a lot of inputs, labor, time, and investment that goes into each one of those plants. And as an industry, we bring a lot uh, to the table there as far as helping not just the growers be profitable, but to save water and to uh, do the kinds of things that we need to do to be responsible for this um, great resource that we've uh, been uh, tasked with. So today we're gonna be talking about some of the challenges of irrigating in the nursery environment which can be a, a tricky space as far as agricultural crops go. Um, what types of irrigation systems are commonly used in, the, uh, in this uh, nursery and greenhouse environment? And so when I'm talking about nursery and greenhouses, really it's like everything from field grown uh, trees and shrubs to can yards, which uh, often a lot of us will think of. And then in greenhouses, greenhouses that are hoop houses, uh, greenhouses, some may be small and managed very tightly, like at your high schools or colleges. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, in these very large production greenhouses that cover many acres at a time uh, to grow these crops. So lots of different types of systems are used within all those different environments. Uh, question then begs, uh, what when do we choose one type of system over another? We're gonna visit that and look at kind of what the systems really do. And then we'll also look at the uniformity of irrigation and what does it really mean? You know, sometimes we as an industry get really used to some of these terms, CU, DU, schedule coefficients, and we toss them about like uh, people know what they mean. 
And, and some of you probably do know what they mean. Others may not. And so we're going to look today at uh, how they're calculated and why does it matter so much to the greenhouse and nursery industries? So those will be the things that we're gonna look at today. So getting started, one of the challenges that come if, with the uh, greenhouse and nursery industry is this huge variety of canopies that you have to penetrate uh, with your irrigation system to be able to water these pots. Uh, that's a very challenging environment. So when you look at, at this uh, photo, you can see they've got hoop houses with sidewalls that are up some of the time, but they're managing their space differently. Uh, their sprinklers are spaced wherever their sprinklers are spaced, but they've got plants in this uh, nursery that have, uh, you know, I'm gonna just highlight here uh, my laser pointer. You know, in this area, of course, we've got plants that are gonna take water a certain way, way differently than that, but all of these areas are dense. And so, um, getting water into that space can be a, a challenge. Now, some of them, I, I went to a local Home Depot and I took some pictures of, of some of the plants that sort of reflect these differences. Um, uh, you know, here's a hostess plant that's like the shape of a catcher's mitt. And then when you can land some water on it, it, it runs down into this leaf surface. And then the, the um, because it's a ball of water, it wants to roll. And then it's got a funnel at the bottom and this little channel in the stem that will carry the water exactly where it needs to go. So if you ever want to plan to show off your irrigation expertise and test on, uh, choose one like this. This one's super easy to irrigate, uh, reaches out, grabs the water and ferries it into the space where it needs it. Um, and so some plants irrigate really easily, others not so much uh, for different reasons. So Plants that receive water poorly, grass can be one that receives water fairly well at times, but they also can develop root balls that really have no place in the root to even take water. And then uh, if you're a couple of plants in from the side, uh, when they're grown in blocks and maybe are in close proximity to each other, and these things change so fast, some of these, uh, you know, grassy types of plants that... Um, it can be really difficult to irrigate uh, these efficiently. And you'll see um, the uh, changes in heights, colors, drought stress, things like that in the beds if you're not doing a good job. So we'll talk about how do you do a good job on things like that. Then there's plants like lupin that will deflect water off the leaf surface. So the leaf, um, you can, they're almost like little springs if your droplet size isn't the right uh, size to penetrate these canopies. This a little bit can help funnel the water in, but largely the water will shed because the density of the canopy. Speaking of dense canopies, and this uh, of course you know is at a, at a Home Depot because I tipped my hand earlier uh, to know that. And these would be grown uh, maybe a little bit farther spaced out in a nursery, but not always, um, but they should be so that the canopy has uh, adequate light, but as they're getting them spaced out so you can get light and air movement to all the leaf surface of these plants, the plant canopy gets denser and deeper and harder to get the water from uh, the outside of the plant up here down into this pot. So it wants to shed the water away from the very location that we need to get it when we're irrigating plants. And so that's why you have different tools. There'll be, you know, drip sometimes, spray stakes, uh, sprinklers uh, obviously are used uh, frequently in can yards and things like that. And we'll look at some of the uh, pros and cons of these different types of irrigation tools that we have. And then I, I titled this slide and the next one, Threading the Needle, because when you're irrigating trees, uh, you've got a, a huge variety of trees in can yards uh, that can be irrigated, but you have to go above the pots, but below the canopy, which can be a, a little bit tricky uh, from a sprinkler perspective, but the advantages there uh, can be tempting to growers. So the advantages of not having a bunch of little tubes to uh, navigate around, and we'll address that more later, but, but some of these environments can be difficult to irrigate. Uh, or this one, when you get into a retail setting, and some of you may have greenhouses similar to this one. This is a picture, just to give credit where it's due. This is whiteforgreenhouse.com. I robbed it off of their site. They're um, back east, I think, uh, in the eastern states. 
Um, but think about all the different things that they need to irrigate and uh, in a, a really beautiful setting like that. But that's a hard place to get all the crops, uh, all the different flowers, not blow them off and uh, get the job done well. A lot of it's hand water, um, but uh, you will all know well how difficult labor is to get at times. So, so you know, foggers, uh, drippers, there's sprinklers are, are often used in these environments. A lot of different ways to uh, try and irrigate that. So, but there's some nursery realities that uh, the large production nurseries across the US and Canada have to deal with. Uh, and these become very large farms into the thousands of acres, some of them. Uh, some of them are very small, but some of them are really big. And uh, they have to water, uh, manage their water with pumping stations at several different locations and main lines and variable frequency drives in their systems so that they're, some of them are the size of small municipal water systems. So they get really big. Um, and water management in a nursery is a challenge for, uh, for these guys. So when you think about any uh, management tool that they've got, it's not just that it's, is it a sprinkler or drip? Um, it becomes, uh, how do we get the water where we need it to the adequate way so we can bring our plants to high uniformities over as much area as we can, um, but there's pumps and valves and automation systems because you have to frequently get back to irrigate a lot of these crops. Uh, you're moving them around quickly. Uh, there's a lot going on. It's highly orchestrated. And uh, so water management is a big challenge on a large nursery for sure. Uh, it's very, or can be very labor intensive. Um, and so we have to uh, know that, um, you know, we've probably all, a lot of us will have had summer jobs or, or uh, early in the career perhaps running a hose at a nursery someplace. And actually it's kind of a, a, a good way to spend a day or two, but it's really labor intensive and it's hard to be really uniform or to get back to uh, plants as quickly as they would like it um, in those soil environments. So that's what makes it really labor intensive. Uh, like we saw in that one picture with all those beautiful flowers, but uh, that would have taken a, a lot of uh, labor to get that hand watered. On a large scale nursery um, in a can yard specifically is what I'm referring to here, only about 30% of the water that is pumped through these large systems actually gets into the pot. And so if you've been on uh, some of these large nurseries, you'll notice that there's you know, sloped and graded uh, uh, beds on them. And then they'll have drainage systems that capture this water that they didn't get to apply this time. And it'll go into ponds, be repressurized, cleaned, put back in to the system. There can be um, a lot of things like, um, you know, uh, fertilizer, foliar feeds, things like that uh, in that water, plus whatever may have drained out of the pots. So they have to use that water, but just right out of the chute, when we're trying to get water into the canopy of the plant and it's shedding it, that can be an inefficiency right out of the start. So we have to be very sensitive to irrigation efficiencies on top of that. Just knowing that the biggest challenge may be the plant itself that we're trying to water. So it's, it's always changing, always dynamic. The plants are growing through the season. Uh, plants get shipped out, beds need to get shut off. New plants come in, they're different size or a different type of plant. Uh, things are always changing and the targets are really small. So when you think about having to get into a, a four inch pot or you know, they're really small or smaller still. Um, so we have to be able to hit those places uh, through obstacles. And then the potting soils that they uh, really design. So that'll be very high organic matter. There's, you know, vermiculite, things that they'll add to these. But the truth is they don't, um, they don't hang on to water super long, all of them. And they don't translocate water laterally through the can very well at all. Uh, they tend to. So we like to water a lot of that from above, uh, which can be difficult as, as you're aware or are learning. And so, um, so that's a challenge too. So those are, those are sort of the rules of engagement when we're designing an irrigation system, uh, choosing which tools we're gonna choose, all of them with strengths and weaknesses. They are all just tools after all. 
Um, but the good news is our industry has some really good tools. And so knowing where to apply those uh, is, is important. So we'll start with looking at some of the target sizes. So here we've got a one gallon container. Our uh, area on the top of that is just six inches in diameter. It's not very big. Uh, and the truth is it goes, it gets worse from there. This was like a, I think a, a uh, what, what they call a, uh, and I'm forgetting what they, what they call it, but it's uh, a plant that I just bought from my yard, uh, just about four and a half inches wide, 14 square inches in that one, down to 12 and a half and a four inch uh, pot. These, these things are getting pretty small and then you place canopies on top of that, that's uh, hard to get there. You know, and then a lot of the nursery environment, um, you'll take uh, trees that are grown in liners for seeds as an example. So, and then these liners, not, it's not just sprinkler uniformity. These are uh, uh, trees that are gonna go into the landscapes. I don't know what type of conifer that they are, but think about all these little liners. So we have to be able to get our water into a really tight spot that holds, ho uh, holds water not for very long. And this, this situation, you can see that may have been uh, stacked poorly on the table. Um, off a little bit. So these had air movement above and below, really difficult to hit that little space. Uh, but that's like $2, $2, $2 loss to the nursery every time one of these dies, even at this stage. So, and then it just sort of gets more valuable from there. So the lost input, when you lose something, the size of a liner can be significant. And so we not just need to do a good job of irrigating, but let's, we have to think about uh, the impact on the nursery and the replications of that. So common types of irrigation used. Um, excuse me. Um, when we think about, uh, you know, we'll just go from uh, low volume things to, to tall, uh, big volume, large volumes. Uh, drip irrigation is very commonly used in uh, many different aspects of uh, the uh, can yards and different uh, environments within the uh, commercial nurseries. There's foggers uh, that can be very helpful and effective in the germination of seeds and things like that. Uh, spray stakes are, are used frequently, uh, you know, and have some advantages. Uh, th this is taking, these boom systems are highly mechanized. We're going to look at, at one of them in a moment. Um, but these are big investments, uh, but they can be pretty helpful. Let's see here. Spinners uh, are, are used frequently in different types of houses. Spinners, uh, and when I say spinners, it can be anything from uh, like Netifin makes them, Nelson Irrigation makes them, uh, Sender makes products that, that are off axis, but act similarly to a spinner uh, as far as the droplet size. So separating spinners from from sprinklers, sprinklers, you know, turn slowly and they have streams. Spinners may have streams too, but they spin very quickly, like into the couple of hundred RPM or even faster for some of them uh, and make very small droplets. And so droplet size is a tool to an irrigation uh, irrigator because uh, then they can go at higher pressures or lower pressures, uh, choose the different type of water emission device, and you get these different types of droplet sizes and spanks, spacings and things like that to help you get the uh, type of droplet that you need to get the job done that's before you. So, uh, of course, sprinklers are very common in um, the nursery environment and have been forever. Uh, less common is flood floor. I'm going to show you one of those if you've not seen one. They, they can be used not just in production uh, nurseries, uh, some certain environments, but can also be used in uh, vegetable production in some parts of the world. So there's uh, flood floors. And then we get up to big guns. So uh, there's really large volume sprinklers. They cover massive area. Uh, but they can get out of the field and stay out of the way. And uh, so there's, these are all just different tools from maybe, uh, you know, a half of a gallon an hour to 400 gallons a minute. Uh, you know, there's tools everywhere in between because there's a lot of different tasks that we need to cover as uh, and irrigating these uh, nurseries. When we start with drip irrigation, you can see like this one is actually a, a drip tape. I'm going to turn my 
pointer back on again. So here's a, a drip tape. So this is a fairly thin wall product with uh, drip emitters uh, every so often. And then they'll place their uh, pots directly under the emitters. Um, it can be pretty efficient for a certain size of pot um, if you match the spacing. But if this plant gets bumped or moved uh, away from where that emission point is in that dripper, that plant will uh, let you know it's having problems because it will just die. Uh, these types of uh, drip irrigation here, uh, you know, it takes a fair bit of labor to build them, uh, but can ferry through these tubes. So this is the dripper itself and the uh, feed tube. And so this might be at, you know, a gallon hour or something, uh, then the tube can take the water and ferry it right up to the, uh, uh, to the plant itself. Uh, and then remember, if you have any questions about any of these things, save it to the end and we'll have a moment to discuss them. Just send them in the chat and then uh, Nicole will be able to uh, manage that. Foggers are commonly used in a lot of uh, these types of environments. You can see these plants are very small. They'd be in a liners, uh, that type of thing like we looked at with those uh, conifers earlier. Uh, these tables will move back and forth. So this, this type of layout, it's actually really nice. Um, the tables can be moved. It's easy to live with uh, as far as uh, there's some advantages there. Uh, irrigating it, these are fairly high and up and out of the way, but the, the water um, droplets, uh, while they're very small, uh, so are the emission points. So having clean water at, at appropriate pressures is an important part of uh, fog systems. So they, uh, very fine droplets, a, a great way to irrigate these types of environments. Spray stakes. Spray stakes have been around a long time, have solved a lot of problems in trying to thread the needle um, in, in these environments. Here we've got, you know, the lateral tube running down. We've got just feeder uh, tube that comes right out of this uh, black polyethylene hose, up a small hose, and then attached to the stop, top of the spray stake uh, in this canyard, which does help you get uh, below the canopy. Of course, so now we're not uh, worried about that. This is fresh out of the box. Here's a pot, what they call pot and pot, if you haven't seen that. So they will uh, dig a big hole in the ground, put a pot in it, and then this helps in the wind. So while trees over here can tip over easy, uh, these ones, it's a lot harder to tip them over. You just place them right in the ground in that other pot. And then, uh, you know, this person will have, it looks like they're putting, as is common, two spray stakes per a pot this size. And here's, uh, this is, uh, these are MaxiJet uh, spray stakes owned by Hunter now and um, common in, in those environments. But when you think about why, why would that gentleman have to be putting, or a worker have to be putting two spray stakes? Um, we talked about the lateral movement of water through these engineered soils in the pots. And this is what a spray stake looks like. It's, you know, the spread in the water. Well, a lot of that water is going to be hitting the, the plant here. But on this side, that, that plant is going to want to send roots over here but there's, the water is gonna be heavy laden on one side of the pot. Um, and then when you think about um, this person, it's like if you were tasked with, okay, we've got a landscape architect and he wants, uh, he is defined I need 50 trees that have a, a caliper of uh, two and a half inches or some number. Now you've got to go in and pull all these different plot uh, trees that meet his need. Well, now you have to walk around all these stakes and that's the, and all these tubes and not trip or, you know, pull them out. Those are, those are one of the downsides uh, to spray stakes. Uh, but the advantage is that you can get the water right there. And so, um, and, it, and maybe you've got a soil mix that does laterally move soil very well. So pros and cons of, of each of these, uh, they are again, as I mentioned earlier, just tools but it's good to have tools because we get ta asked uh, many different things. Boom irrigation, uh, here's a spray boom. You can see the uh, sprayers uh, running down here. This is actually uh, a leafy greens crop uh, of uh, lettuce, it looks like, um, and, and in this particular situation, but they could be just as easily, um, you know, uh, little flowers. A lot of people have uh, up on tables, this is real common system in some parts of the world, but this boom just, you can see the hose is kind of coiled there and it just goes out and straightens the hose out as it moves down the house. Um, 
This can be a, a very efficient way to do that. If you've got enough water pressure, uh, there's is, you know, some additional expense in the rail system. Uh, so there, and there's maintenance and get, keeping these things going, uh, but a good, a good tool just the same. Uh, for the right crop, again, just being a tool, just like any of these things are. Here's a, an inverted spinner, um, and we'll talk about sprinkler orientation in a moment. Um, in a large shade structure, uh, you know, with lots and lots of uh, uh, plants in it. This is also another very common way uh, to irrigate things that are, let's say, four inch or larger woody plants. So that's where we'll see this type of system used more frequently. Smaller, maybe more drip irrigation, and these larger ones are tend to be sprinkler or, uh, you know, irrigated of some type, be they spinners or stream sprinklers, you know, uh, IWABs, uh, maxi jets, uh, whatever the, um, uh, some type of a sprinkler. Uh, this is the uh, S10 spinner right here. Um, and then with them being inverted in these types of houses, here's a, a hoop house with no sidewall um, and they'll have sprinklers hanging down the center and they'll have flats, of course, down here on the shade cloth. Uh, this one's uh, a uh, inverted wobbler. Uh, this is that little spray stake and then the S10 spinner. And why I wanted to show you this one, um, this is uh, in Oregon on a large nursery and there is black uh, poly tube that's run and suspended down their uh, house. And it's important, one of the things that's important to remember in doing these types of systems above ground is you wanna avoid white pipe. You know, white pipe being PVC pipes, readily available, it's easy to get in a lot of places, but you don't really wanna put it above ground because here we'll have taken water from a, maybe an external pond or something like that. Uh, we're pressurizing it into this irrigation system through a filter, and then we put it into these sprinklers. Well, we will, in a white irrigation pipe, like a uh, like PVC pipe will allow light inside. And there's algae spores and things that will, we will grow algae in the pipe. And when that flakes off, it will plug the sprinklers. And so you like to be able to do what, what was done here. Uh, use black pipe or at least uh, CPVC or something that keeps light outside uh, from from penetrating the inside of that pipe. So, uh, you know, there's lots of ways to, to skin that cat, but um, uh, just don't let it be white pipe in the sunshine. And it also degrades a lot quicker. So, um, you know, that's, that's a, there are lots of ways that people do different things, but that I think would be an important note to make. One of the things that are common in smaller houses, let's say 20 feet wide or narrower, and they'll have uh, maybe a center walkway with beds on both sides, is been difficult uh, in our industry to say, well, we've got this huge variety of plants, but we really want to keep things out of the way. So uh, it's uh, not uncommon to use a turf sprinkler that's highly efficient, like this one. This was the MP rotator. It's um, by Hunter Irrigation, it's got, this is on a um, regular agricultural feed tube assembly with this little adapter. And so that allows you to put the uh, part circle MP rotator onto an agricultural riser. And you can, if you can see it, there's some poly line running down here. So it's not dissimilar to the one that was hanging up above, um, but it gives you a very efficient part circle option uh, if your plant material will uh, abide it. And a lot of that will have to do with sprinkler spacing. We're gonna talk about that more in a moment. But so this would give you a part circle option, even though at times uh, you may have crops that uh, get in the way. And then now can yards. Uh, uh, impacts have been uh, king of this environment for a really long time. The, the rotators, which are basically uh, stream sprinklers, but have, uh, no moving parts and water pressure. And then the uh, IWABs like this one that move really quickly and have a, a different sort of a, a action that gives you a different si kind of a, a droplet size that can be helpful. All of these are very common in the nursery industry across North America um, in can yards. Uh, these, these pots you can see spaced out a little bit, which helps uh, irrigators um, always in can yards 
like in your landscape or anywhere else, sprinkler spacing and density can contribute to irrigation uniformity. And when you're in a nursery environment, having lots of angles of approach into any of these pots can be really, really beneficial. And so sprinkler spacing matters. And we'll look more into that in a moment. Here's a picture of a flood floor. This is out of the Greenhouse Grower magazine. Um, but you can see this is, uh, you know, a, a flower crop. We've got it in pot. And they flood this uh, floor shallowly and then let it drain. And they'll flood it again and then let it drain. And this kind of happens real frequently throughout the day, uh, keeping a real consistent moisture sort of wicking up through the uh, soil that they've put in this pot. So um, that's not uncommon. It uses the same uh, you know, type of valves that we do in other types of agriculture, um, just to, but, the, but it's under low pressure because it's only flooding a couple inches deep. Um, so anyway, if you haven't seen a flood floor before, that's, that's what they look like. Not, not super common, but uh, not un, unused at all. And then we get into a little bit more agricultural environment or what we would commonly view in an agricultural environment. Here we're growing lots of different, uh, you know, actually maybe several different crops in, in this particular photo, but they're just grown out and then will be dug in the field and placed in pots. So they'll grow trees this way. They grow lots of things this way that are hardy, uh, that will benefit from, uh, you know, uh, being placed out in the field for a while, and then they'll come in and dig them. You know, this one's in Oregon, uh, this picture. That's Mount St. Helens in the background. Uh, but so here we've gone from sprinklers that are, you know, drip emitters, a few gallons an hour to hundreds of gallons a minute, but uh, sprays over a very large area. So they're all tools that are used in the uh, irrigation of nursery crops. One of the things that, uh, from my perspective, that I get asked a lot, and, and nursery irrigation is not that dissimilar to what they use in riding arenas or other you know, sort of enclosed spaces when you're in a greenhouse or shade structure, uh, you know, like we're looking at here, is they'll think, well, I'm just going to take a sprinkler and I'm just going to hang it from the roof. Well, sprinkler orientation matters. There's a lot of engineering, and I'm going to I'm going to try and, and do this here, but if you can if you can see that, there's a lot of different shapes and engineering in this uh, each of these grooves, and so if you've got uh, th this is not a sprinkler from the nursery industry, but it does show the grooves. Here's here's one. If you think about this sprinkler here, this is an MP rotator, and this one's in a lawn. But if if you see, there's a amount of water coming out of that sprinkler, and some of it is grabbed by this plate and sprays very, very closely down to get the close in water of a lawn. You've got some that spray out a little bit. You've got some streams that gather more water out of the stream and then shoot it a long ways because it's supposed to go to the outside of the circle where there's more area. And this is to develop a very uniform pattern. So what happens if you turn that sprinkler upside down because you want to use it in an uh, inverted environment is now that stream that you had to go a long ways out, cover all sorts of area is now spraying down and it's hitting very close and you're spending lots of water very close to the sprinkler and you're not using that product then in the way that the engineers had designed it to operate. So sprinkler orientation matters. There are sprinklers designed and spinners of all these types that are designed to work inverted. Uh, there are a few that you can use in either direction. Uh, and so, you know, feel free there. But most sprinklers are designed to uh, be oriented either inverted, uh, as is hanging upside down or upright, uh, you know, like we're used to seeing them. So this really matters. You can't just take one and turn it upside down if it's not designed to be that way. So that part matters. And here's, here's uh, one of the reasons why. When a sprinkler has a profile like this, and so this would be how if you ran one sprinkler all by itself, and sprinklers are not generally designed to operate alone, uh, they're, they're designed to be operating in sets, and we'll look at that more deeply in a moment as well. But this is how they spend water. You know, different types of sprinklers may have a fairly flat pattern throughout the radius. Other ones, uh, you know, need a lot more water spent right here to help them uh, turn around. Uh, impacts have patterns real similar to this. And so based on their spacing, you can have pretty uniform, uh, based on the spacing, maybe not so uniform. So when you think about the amount of water it takes, and you can see that I need 
multiple sprinklers to contribute into their patterns. And I can't just take this sprinkler that was designed to have all this water way out and outside of its pattern, and then all of a sudden spin it in here. Uh, we will really change the way that sprinkler will be operating. That's an important thing to remember. So here's a, here's a spinner. This one's the S10 inverted gray plate, Nelson Irrigation product. Uh, there's a drain check on it right here, just above it to keep the water from draining out of the riser. And then there's this spinner. It's a couple hundred RPM, but very flat plate and very fine uh, droplets over, over a large area. So these will be used in uh, shade structures that are not hoop houses, this particular one. So it goes, um, you know, you just use them in patterns that are be, maybe be 20 or 17 feet apart based on the size of the structure you're trying to get, but this common. But then you get other plates that have, you can be used upright or inverted. Uh, this one uh, is used in an upright, but can also be used upside down. So some of those uh, can be used in either orientation, um, but all of them spinning fast to give you a certain size of droplet. And other manufacturers too make those type their products that can be used in either way, but commonly uh, the orientation matters. The reason that you choose one or the other of the tools that we've looked at has a lot to do with the pressure available, the flow rates available per sprinkler, and uh, what are we irrigating? And in the nurseries, you're often irrigating lots of different things. Uh, so, so you need to be prepared for all of that. And um, going with things that have smaller droplets in hoop houses, uh, but fairly high sprinkler densities can help a lot. Um, if you're in can yards, you may need streams to help have mass to fight wind and penetrate canopies there. So lots of different uh, things going on. But when we think about um, the job that we have to save water and save power, we think about if you had, uh, and what do these uh, uniformity numbers mean that we've talked about? So here you've got 26 head in an example. These are, the, the largest nurseries don't tend to worry about part circle sprinklers at all. They don't have time to worry about that. They want the same sprinkler everywhere because they're gonna have a lot of them. And so um, if you haven't uh, become familiar with these terms, you might have two systems, okay? And they're beds next to each other. And you've got uh, 26 sprinklers, you got 40 PSI, uh, well, eighth inch nozzle, here's your flow rate. And your job is to apply a half of an inch of water to that can yard. This would maybe be an outside setting. So if you do the math, um, these would take 176 minutes until you apply uniformity. And when, when you apply uniformity, you think here in system A, at 75% DU, and I'm gonna to explain to you in a moment why this matters so much, that 75% distribution uniformity, the DU, that system would run 234 minutes, not 176 minutes, to apply that half of inch of water to the driest 25%. 234, not 176. That's going to take 17,000 gallons of water uh, in those 26 sprinklers, 4,358 gallons more than you thought you were going to need. Um, if you just did the math and we're assuming that you had 100% uniformity because you said, well, I've got this much water, I've got this many sprinklers, etc. If you can improve by just 10% that uniformity, you cut your runtime down to 207 minutes and uh, you're still using more than the, uh, you know, 13,000 gallons per minute, we're using up to 15,000, but uh, a big improvement, just in that 10% uniformity improvement saves you 2,028 gallons per minute out of just 26 sprinklers every time you need to apply a uh, half of an inch of water. And this would be at like a one acre beds, uh, not, an, not a uncommon size in large production nurseries. And then if you think, okay, so I'm saving this much water on top of, uh, you know, I've got to thread the needle, I've got to, uh, you know, apply water and only part of it's going to get into the pots anyway. Uh, uniformity starts to really, really matter. And so what are our goals in uniformity is we're going to apply just what's needed, okay, to the water. We're going to apply it uniformly over the whole area. So the higher the uniformity numbers, the better that is. Uh, from an irrigation perspective. And we wanna maintain this consistently over year after year after year. And um, that's important. The irrigation realities in though, in uh, these types of areas is that if you've got a sprinkler here 
and a sprinkler in these locations, but they're circles and we're placing them in a square, this area is getting four sprinklers that contribute to it. Here's three, there's only two there, four in this space. I mean, we've got circles into squares and so there's always compromises in those types of things. But, but these multiple points give us a gift. And that gift is lots of ways to try and get into that pot. And that's a, a very helpful thing. Ag water is not always clean. Okay, so it's not like, uh, you know, having a really clean water buried underground and piped into your house. We've got uh, a lot of things that we have to deal with in agricultural settings to uh, get water into these pots. And they're affected by lots of other stuff like, the, the wind, the temperature, humidity, all these types of things for these outside can yards especially, or when they not have canopies over their hoop houses, they're exposed to the elements. And so we have to factor those types of things as well. And know that their input costs are significant to these guys. They're running a lot of water all the time. And so everything's multiplied by a bunch. Okay, so so any little change that we can do to save is also multiplied by a bunch. And so uniformity uh, and things help. This is a, just a photo of what an ununiform system looks like. Um, there's, uh, you know, you can see that this field has just been irrigated and it's drying unevenly. And that's one way to, to sort of do a little quick audit uh, without having to actually do an audit is like, how evenly does my ground dry? You know, whether this was a gravel lot, uh, or uh, you know, a cultivated bed where they're planting a crop, you can see here that, that these are not uniform. Other things are that um, the risers are wonky all over the place. So if you've got um, a you know, 24 degree sprinkler and that's, it's what you've planned on when you did your uniformity analysis and now you've got it five degrees off to the side, uh, we don't have a 24 degree sprinklers anymore. And that radius that we were planning on in one way, the stream's a lot higher, it's more affected by the wind, the other one's a lot lower, and it's not going to shoot far because it's 19 degrees now, and the other one's almost 30. And so it's, uh, it's important to have risers straight. And this matters in can yards. There's lots of life in can yards, things that matter. Uh, you know, they're moving plants in and out, trucks hit stuff. It's just what happens there. And so um, we need to make sure that those types of things are straight. Because when it's ununiform, if you had to, uh, you know, think about, well, which one of these do I want to manage? I've got a system that's very ununiform. You've got pots all over this place. Um, what do you think the plant uniformity is going to be like? And plant uniformity is what the nurseries get paid for. Okay, so we want systems that are much higher in uniformity so that their resulting product, which is their sellable product from an agricultural perspective, uh, it needs to be very, very uniform also uh, with as low input costs as possible. So we, we really do need uh, uniformity. So CU and DU, we've talked about both of those. Uh, here's what they mean. You can see in this uh, scenario, there's a sprinkler here and here and here. It's a kind of a triangulated pattern. And this is, uh, if you're not familiar, this is what's called a densigram. And so you can see, you know, from the sprinklers, how the water's contributing from these different sprinklers, how the patterns are contributing to each other. And so um, if you were going to run an audit, uh, you would put catchments out. We're going to catch some water, you know, next to sprinklers, between the sprinklers, et cetera, and run it for a certain amount of time. And then, uh, and the pots kind of are doing this all the time for us anyway in a can yard. And then you get this information and you put it down on a sheet and DU, what that means is we're going to, in milliliters, measure every, the amount of water in every one of the catchments and put it from the lowest amount to the highest amount on our sheet of paper spreadsheet. Now the I has the Irrigation Association has classes on how to do audits if you're not familiar. Um, but DU basically means what is the average of my driest 25% of catchments divided by the average of all the catchments. And that's going to tell you how dry is my driest place. Well, if you were tasked with putting that half again inch of water down in this environment, you're going to have to over irrigate 75% of your area to get that half an inch needed to uh, your driest 25% of your area. Now, if we're paying attention to uh, 
you know, input costs and things like that, you can see that we need this number to be as high as possible um, because we don't want to have to over irrigate land uh, that much. So if you do the average is 5.7 milliliters divided by the average of all of them, 11.8, and hang on to that number we're going to need at the moment, uh, that's a 48.3% DU. That's uh, pretty bad. Okay, so we, we need much better uniformity than that. The higher, the better. Coefficient of uniformity also matters in the nursery environment. Uh, so looking at that same can yard, uh, the same audit, even the same catchments, you'll see these red numbers. And what a CU number does is it starts to account for the wet places also. So if you're in certain crops, that matters a lot too. And so here we've got the deviation from our 11.8 that we had, which is our average. We learned that in the last slide. And so now we deviate um, above or below in these you know, different numbers. Some of them are fairly close and some of them are a long ways from that. So here we take um, the wet places, the dry places. So here's the mean uh, of all of our um, catchments. Here's the total deviation from that mean and it comes up with a CU number of 66%, also still very, very low. So we need to be able to uh, improve these types of things. And so we have to think about, well, what affects uniformity? The things that can affect uniformity in a can yard environment, in a, a greenhouse or, well, in, in a nursery, especially perhaps out, out on the nursery in the can yards, is the flow rate of the sprinklers. So we've got to think about how much water is coming out of each of these sprinklers, and we need them all to be the same. Uh, the radius. So if we've got a three gallon per minute sprinkler and we're counting on it to spray 40 feet, we need it to always spray 40 feet. If we have three gallons a minute over 20 feet, our precipitation rate just went up by a bunch, right? Or 50 feet, it's not as high. It's the same amount of flow rate over these different amounts of area that changes our precip rate, which affects our uniformity, our precipitation rate. So it affects our uniformity. So we need, need these things to be very, very similar, uh, pretty much the same. This, these affect the uniformity. So every sprinkler should have the same pressure. Of course, to, you know, nozzle plugging, these things affect how much water shoots out of a nozzle of a sprinkler. If the uh, pressures change, we'll have more or less water squeeze through that nozzle. If it's partially plugged, it effectively is now smaller and it's changing the shape of the stream that comes out of the uh, nozzle. That, uh, uh, that's a problem. Uh, riser straightness we talked about. Wind, of course, uh, affects sprinklers in an in outdoor environment and the sprinkler, the spa uh, sprinkler spacing should be very, very consistent. You can't be random in these uh, things. They need to be you know, very, very uniform. All these things affect how uniform the resulting system is. That's, uh, that's true in a can yard. It's also true in uh, things like uh, indoor spaces. So here's a 24 by 100 foot single row of irrigation. Here's the pipeline running down this hoop house. And we've got a CU and DU numbers that um, if we just change the spacing, so the exact same sprinkler, this is at 18 feet apart. If we go to 12 feet apart, you can see the scalloping edges move farther and farther to the outside because we're taking these circles and we're stacking them in a row. And the farther that we can push that uh, scalloping to the edge, then the more uniform our system becomes. Here we've got 86 CU, 76 DU, far better than what we saw in our uh, earlier examples. It's often uh, that I see people, especially with smaller um, uh, you know, plants going to things like double line. So if you had in your 25, uh, 24 foot wide house, uh, you went with smaller sprinklers, uh, again, at 18 feet apart, but we needed now two lines down the house because often there'll be a walkway down the center uh, two lines can be managed and get you very uniform systems, but it's not as simple as you think. You don't just take, go in a quarter, uh, go across to half, and then there's leaves you a quarter, the the because you then tend to overwater the center. Um, so the the lines in in double double row systems are often biased toward the outside, biased toward the sidewall. So in this case, I think what I had was three feet, 18 feet, and three feet, and so that's uh, the case. And when you go Again, still just tightening the spacing up, 
then we're starting to get into really uniform systems that look really good and we could expect really good improvement from them. So how do we improve uh, the system uniformity of our irrigation system? We're gonna check the pressure at lots of heads. We need to know how are we doing, learn how to do audits. You have to clean it and inspect the heads every season. What happens in, uh, I'll get to this next point, Nurseries, uh, these, the, the team of workers out in nurseries are often really reactive. If we got a plug sprinkler, sometimes uh, or broken one because it's been hit, they just grab the sprinkler that they've got and put it in that space because they're in a hurry. The problem is then the sprinkler, we got some big nozzles, small ones, different types of sprinklers, all these things that affect uniformity. So we need to go through every season and make sure when we're testing these beds before the irrigation season hits in earnest and say, do we really have good uniformity, are they all the same? Or are they what we expected when we designed the system? Or can we improve? Is there better products out there? Check your riser straightness. Uh, the sprinkler density will almost always help your uniformity. And to prove that to yourself, you need to uh, test, uh, run an audit, and then you're going to know. Like, check your own papers. How am I doing with this system? So I apologize if I've uh, run a little bit long. But we do have a little bit of time for a couple of questions. Thank you for your attention today. Um, Nicole, do we have any questions? I'm not seeing any come in yet. Do you guys have any questions? Uh, as a Feel reminder, free to yeah, turn yourself off of mute. And... Yep. Great. Well, Nicole, um, yeah, yeah, giving another moment for one to turn in, but uh, thank you for having me today. It was an honor. Uh, we appreciate all that you guys and the team at the Irrigation Association do to put on uh, the Faculty Academy and the trade shows. Hopefully everybody uh, that's attending today will be able to make it to the IA show in San Diego this December. And um, uh, anyway, thank you again for your time and for attending. If there's any questions, we'll go ahead and take it now. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Guys. Um, for those of you that will be attending the sessions tomorrow, they do begin at 12 o'clock uh, Eastern time. Tomorrow is the last day of our virtual Ag Faculty Academy webinar series. Again, that'll be starting at 12 Eastern. We'll have two sessions and that will finish out our final session. Again, thank you, Steve, for doing this wonderful presentation on nursery and greenhouse irrigation. Um, and if you have any questions uh, to ask Steve offline, his contact information is in the speaker bios information I sent out via Dropbox. With that, thank you for tuning in and I will see those of you that are attending tomorrow at noon Eastern. Thank you.